Hibernation 23. Grizzlies Growls presents Stories from a Hibernation. A Handy Guide for Beggars, especially those of the Poetic Fraternity, by Rachel Lindsay. Part 2 A Mendicant Pilgrimage in the East. Death, the Devil, and Human Kindness Being the Shred of an Allegory Part 4 The Allegory Breaks Down My Friend, Human Kindness with the Green Galluses I hope for a farmhand's house Only in that sort will they give me free lodging so near to town And friends, I found it There on the edge of the second cornfield The welcome was unhesitating. I looked at my host aghast. To satisfy my sense of the formal, he should have had the dignity to make him Father Adam and Lord of Paradise. How could one round out a day that began loftily with death, continued gloriously with someone mighty like the devil, with this inglorious type now before me? He wrecked my allegory. There is no climax in stupidity. Just as the colorless one-room house had stove, chimney, cupboard, adequate roof, floor, and walls, so the owner had the simplified anatomical and phrenological makeup of a man. He had a lukewarm hand clasp. He smoked a Pittsburgh stogie. He had thick, vague features and a shock of drab hair. The nearest to a symbol about him was his new green galluses. I suppose they indicated I was out in the fields again. If his name was not stupidity, it was awkwardness. He kept a sick geranium and an old tomato can in the window. He had not cut off the bent back cover of the can. Just after he gave me a seat, he scratched his hand as he was watering the flower and swore softly. And yet one must not abuse his host— I hasten to acknowledge his generous hospitality. If it be not indelicate to mention it, he boiled much water and properly diluted it with cold that the traveler might bathe. The bath was accomplished out of doors beneath the shades of evening. Well, later he was making preparations for supper with dull eyes that looked nowhere. He made sure I fitted my chair. He put an old comfort over it. It was well. The chair was not naturally comfortable. It was partly a box. After much fumbling about, he brought some baked potatoes from the oven. The plate was so hot he dropped it, but so thick it would not break. He picked up the potatoes, as good as ever, and broke some open for me, spreading them with tolerable butter and handing them across the table. Then I started to eat. "'Wait a minute,' he said. He bowed his head, closed his dull eyes, and uttered these words. The Lord make us truly thankful for what we are about to receive. Amen. I have been reproved by some of the judicious for putting so much food in these narratives. Nevertheless, the first warm potato tasted like peacock's tongues, the next like venison, and the next like ambrosia, and the next like a good warm potato with butter on it. One might as well leave Juliet out of Verona as food like this out of a road story. As we ate, we hinted to each other of our many ups and downs. He mumbled along, telling his tale. He did not care whether he heard mine or not. He had been born nearby. In early manhood, he'd been taken with the oil fever. It happened in this wise. He had cut his foot splitting kindling— Meditating ambition as he slowly recovered, he resolved to go to town, sold his small farm, and wasted his substance in speculation. At the same time, his young wife and only child died of typhoid fever. He was a laborer a while in the two cities to the northeast, and then he came back here to plow corn. He had been saving for two years, had made money enough to go back pretty soon, and entered what he considered a sure thing scheme that I gathered had a close relation to the oil business. 
He said that he had learned from experience to sift the good from the bad in that realm of commerce. He put brakes on the slow freight train of his narrative. I was about to explain when you came in that uh, don't afford dessert to my meals often. If you'll excuse me, I said, emptying my pockets, these figs, these dates, these oranges, and these animal crackers were given me by death and the devil. Eat hearty. Death and the devil? What kind of they? Oh, they're not a bad sort. Death gave me honey for dinner. Devil did no worse than drive me a little out of my way. He smiled vaguely. He thought it was a joke and was too interested in the food itself to ask any more questions. The balmy, smokeless wind from the south was whistling, whistling past the window and through the field. How much one can understand by mere whispers. The wind cried, life, life, life. Some of the young corn was brushing the walls of the cottage, and armies on armies of young corn were bivouacking further down the road, lifting their sacred tassels toward the stars. There was no change in the expression of the countenance of my host, eating, talking, or sitting still in the presence of the night. I may have had uh, too poor an estimate of his powers, but I preached no sermon that evening. But, like many a primitive man I've met, he preached me a sermon. He had no bed. He gave the traveler a place to sleep in one corner, and himself slept in the opposite corner. The floor was smooth and clean and white, and the many scraps of rag carpet and the clean comfort over me were a part of the sermon. Another part was in his question before he slept. Does the air from that open window bother you? I assured him I wanted all there was, though from the edge of the world. He had awkwardly folded his new overcoat and put it under my head, and so I was beginning to change his name from stupidity and awkwardness to human kindness. Though in five minutes he was snoring like Sousa's band, I could not but sleep. When I awoke, the sun was in my eyes. It shone through the open door. Mr. Human Kindness was up. The smell of baked potatoes was in the air. Outside rustled the corn. The wind cried, Life, life, life. Thanks for listening to Stories from the Hibernation. Comment on the website at grizzly.libsyn.com. This program is sponsored by donations from people like you and is released with a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.